Today's video is sponsored by Backblaze. Get a free 15 day trial to back up your files at backblaze.com forward slash side projects. More on them in a bit. Before its discovery and colonization, the inhabitants of the Americas had been separated from the rest of the human race for thousands of years. Save for the occasional interaction with, for example, some adventurous Vikings that made it all the way to modern day Canada, there was no long term trade or communication across the oceans. This means that weapons in the Americas developed in a completely different way than those on other continents, where cultures had been constantly sharing inventions with each other, like bronze and iron. Today, we're going to look at three weapons from ancient America, what makes them unique, and what makes them deadly. Perhaps the most iconic weapon of pre-Columbian America is the Makawit. The Makawit is a flat paddle weapon with several obsidian blades protruding from the wood. These weapons were used by the Aztec, Maya, and other Mesoamerican civilizations, but the earliest known use dates back as far as a thousand years ago, predating even the Aztecs. Most of them were only a meter in length and had relatively small handles. The Mahautis were also known for their surprising amount of variety in the design department. Some had blades down both sides of the wood, while other lighter versions had them only on one side. Another unique aspect was the amount of obsidian blades attached. There was no magic number. Some had just three or four longer blades on each side, and others had over a dozen smaller pieces resembling scales. The legendary two-handed weapon was reportedly as tall as a man, though these were understandably much rarer than the smaller one-handed versions. And let's not forget the unbladed version used for sparring at a young age. The wood handles could be either plain or intricately carved and decorated. So what made this weapon so effective that it was used for hundreds of years and even scared the Spanish when they arrived. Firstly, it was extremely portable. The Aztecs didn't have beasts of burden, so going to war meant marching hundreds of kilometers while carrying your own equipment. The Muati was light, making it easier for each soldier to carry his own along with a small shield, and was still able to swing it at a decent speed, making it ideal for the chaos of jungle warfare. It's also important to keep in mind that human sacrifice was a large part of Aztec culture, and prisoners of war were common sacrifices. Spaces between blades and limits the extent of damage done in a single swipe, and the flat side of the wood paddle can be used to knock someone unconscious instead of killing them if needed. The weapon was also fairly cheap to produce, since the Aztec Empire had tens of thousands stored in cases of war. And now on to the star of the show the obsidian blades. Metalworking was quite rare in the Americas and was mostly for ornamental purposes like jewelry. So apart from a select few made from meteoric iron, metal weapons were quite rare. In the place of metal, obsidian made a great substitute and in some respects was even better. Obsidian forms when lava quickly cools in contact with water, leaving large deposits after volcanic events. The Aztecs quarried their obsidian from these deposits and were experts at napping. Briefly, napping is a process by which a skilled worker strikes the obsidian with a rock or a hammer like object, chipping and cleaving it into a shape that can then be formed into a sharp blade. Napping techniques developed on every continent, but Aztec napping was the most advanced in the entire world. Their obsidian was worked twice, the first time at the quarry, where large blocks were chipped into smaller pieces called a blank, getting rid of the unusable or extra material and only shipping back the essentials. The smaller piece was then transported to a napper, who would finish sharpening the blade and attaching it to wood. Obsidian has its pros and cons as a blade. Its main disadvantage is that it can't be formed into a long blade like you would expect for an average sword, it's simply too brittle and the blade would snap under pressure. This is why obsidian weapons generally feature several smaller blades and not one long edge, but its advantage is that it's the sharpest known material on earth, even sharper than a steel scalpel. It's commonly said that the edge of an obsidian blade can be sharpened down to the width of a single atom, but realistically this would be impossible to achieve. The blade can, however, be sharpened to just a few nanometers in width by an experienced napper. Aztec obsidian was so sharp that the Spanish who encountered it were terrified by its lacerating potential. Conquistadors wrote of them repeatedly throughout their conquests, claiming that it was sharp enough to decapitate not only a man, but a horse. For example, Bernal Diaz del Castillo wrote, Pedro de Moron was a very good horseman, and as he charged with three other horsemen into the ranks of the enemy, the Indians seized hold of his lance, and he was not able to drag it away, and others gave him cuts with their broadswords and wounded him badly, and then they slashed at the mare and cut her head off at the neck so that it hung by the skin, and she fell dead. Another account from conquistador Francisco de Aguila reads, one Indian, at a single stroke, cut open the whole neck of Cristobal de Olid's horse, killing the horse. 
Modern anthropologists believe that the ability to behead a horse in one swing is likely an exaggeration, but the bleeding that an obsidian blade could cause is still serious. In fact, Terry Shappert, Green Beret and martial artist, found this out the hard way when he cut the back of his leg swinging an obsidian weapon on the History Channel show Warriors. Now we'll get back to today's video in just a second, but first a quick word from one of my favorite sponsors, Backblaze. The best way to back up your files is with Backblaze. And look, I know backup isn't the sexiest topic, it's not the sexiest sponsor that we have, but it is super important. Generally in the past you'd be like, okay, well I'm gonna copy these files to this disk and then I'll take this disk home or some nonsense like that. These days, the way I do it, and I have a lot of files to back up, I make a lot of videos, is I have Backblaze installed on my computer and it's always there just sending off my new files to Backblaze's servers where they live and then should I need them I'll be like hello Backblaze can I have my files back and they'll be like yes you can here you go brilliant you can download them they can ship out a disk for you I've actually used Backblaze for I'd say like a year or two before we ever started working with them for the first time as a sponsor and that's because they are the best and they do it at an incredible price you can get unlimited backup there's no catches there's no gimmicks nothing like that it's just unlimited I back up a lot of stuff a lot of videos and as you can imagine and it's seven dollars a month which is crazy they've also restored 55 billion files they have two exabytes of data which is two billion gigabytes by the way so it's a lot of files they really know what they're doing they are the best it's backblaze and like i say you can get a free trial just go to backblaze.com forward slash side projects and right now you guys can enjoy a fully featured 15 day no credit card required free trial at backblaze.com forward slash side projects it really is the best and best of all this deal is just in time for world backup day which is march 31st so thank you backblaze and now back to today's video Obsidian weapons are great for battle, but hunting with them is understandably difficult. To effectively hunt quick prey like deer, a ranged weapon is a must, and the ancient Americas had plenty to choose from. It's well known that bows and arrows were one of the most common weapons among Native Americans, both for warfare and for hunting. They were likely introduced several thousand years ago from Siberian nomads that crossed the Bering Strait and slowly spread throughout the continent. But even before the bow was introduced, the Native Americans had mastered a different form of weapon to attack from a distance. The Atlaut. The Atlaut is a device designed to accurately launch a spear or dart further than the human arm can throw it. The design is quite simple. A slightly curved rod with a hook on one end attaches into a notch at the bottom of a spear's shaft. This creates a basic lever with joints between the hunter's arms, the Atlatl, and the spear. When the hunter's arm flings forward, the leverage created from these points is capable of thrusting the projectile forward at a deadly 150 kilometers an hour or 93 miles per hour. Because of its simple design, there was a lot of variation between these. Normally, they were around half a meter in length, made from slightly curved wood or bone, and were commonly decorated or carved. Some even featured a stone or wooden weight, which has puzzled anthropologists, as it doesn't seem to add any force to the throw, though there is some speculation that it stabilizes the user's aim. Because of the clever use of leverage, they don't require much strength to use. American anthropologist John Whitaker says that because the weapon requires skill instead of strength, it leveled the playing field and allowed women to participate in hunting, making it a social tool as well as a hunting one the word for it comes from the aztec language but they were used all around the world there's even some speculation that a european man from 42,000 years ago used one because of the arthritis found in his elbow that was common with the weapon's usage but the weapon is especially significant to the history of the americas because while the rest of the world was moving on to bows and never looking back at Louds never went out of star with the native americans and were still even being used alongside bows when european explorers arrived almost every major american civilization used them from Alaska all the way to the Andes and the earliest known usage on the continent dates to around 4,000 years ago this is inferred from a dart fragment discovered in the Yukon ice patches at louds were featured in artwork from the American Southwest in the basket maker culture and were also an important part of imagery in Tenochtitlan where a prominent leader named spear thrower owl is depicted with his at in stone carvings Moving south in the Amazon, they were used not only for hunting game on land, but surprisingly also for fishing. Some cultures were so good with them that they even preferred them to bows, sometimes tipping their spearheads with poison for good measure. In the Andes Mountains, however, they were so central to the Moche culture that they even took on a religious significance. An estelica is the Spanish word for an atlaut from the Andes that has been designed for ornamental use instead of as a weapon. These ceremonial pieces were almost twice as long as a normal one and were intricately carved, their handles engraved with stories and dim 
images of deities and animals. At one excavation in Peru, a mummy known as the Lady of Sao was found with 23 of these ritual louts at her feet, each of which depicted various birds. These were likely buried with her to show that, in life, she was a fearsome warrior. Unfortunately, its use declined sharply after European nations began colonizing the Americas. The Aztecs used them to fight back against their new enemies, and the launched spears sometimes had enough force to even penetrate some chainmail armor, but were ultimately no match for New Age warfare. But the good news is recent times have seen an effort to revive and preserve the legacy of the weapon. Several U.S. states legalized using them to hunt wildlife such as deer or turkey, and in 1987, the World Atlout Organization was formed, which organizes Atlout competitions at American universities. Throws as far as 260 meters have been recorded at some of these competitions, which really does showcase how lethal they could be. Our last featured Native American weapon is the blowgun. Blowguns have been seen in cultures in Southeast Asia and Western Europe, but perhaps the most well-known examples are from the Americas. Lots of cultures in the Americas turned their breath into a lethal weapon, but a few in particular stand out. First up, the Cherokee. The Cherokee Indians are a tribe from the southeastern United States and are well known for their skilled crafting of blowguns as well as their stealthy hunting tactics with them. A traditional Cherokee blowgun is made with a type of river cane, the only bamboo to grow in North America. Techniques passed through generations involve using flint or a hot coal to clean out the bamboo shoot, after which the joints and rough spots are smoothed out and straightened. The gun is usually between two and three meters long. After the cane is straightened and dried, a wooden dart with a fur end is inserted. It. This fur is what creates the seal that channels all the force from the lungs into the dart, propelling it forward. With these bamboo snipers, the Cherokee mastered the art of silently stalking their game, which was mainly rabbits and other small animals, and fired their blow darts with impressive accuracy. With favorable winds, an experienced shooter could nail a target up to 30 meters away. In other cultures, though, blowpipe weapons had an added layer of lethality poison. Some tribes tip their darts with curare, which is a generic term for poison found in a few plants native to South America. Curare causes muscle paralysis, which quickly leads to asphyxiation. In other plants, the sandbox tree produces a poison that the natives of the Caribbean put on their darts. Animals also provided a source of poison. In South America, poison dart frogs were an excellent source. Some frogs had to be roasted over a fire to extract enough poison for a dart, but some species just have so much poison that simply dipping the dart onto its back is sufficient. Just don't accidentally touch the frog we are extracting the poison from or you're going to have a bad time. Each frog has enough poison on its skin to kill 10 humans. There's some debate about the use of poisonous darts in North America, but some tribes, such as the Choctaw, have an oral history of using poison in the past. There's also some claims that in the southwest United States, poison was taken from Gila monsters, one of only two venomous lizards on Earth. Other tribes claim that rattlesnake poison was used by agitating the snake until it bit a prepared animal liver, which would then house the rattlesnake's venom until the dart was dipped in it. Overall, blowguns were extremely effective for hunting and for battle. Regular wooden darts like those mentioned from the long Cherokee blowguns are highly effective at taking out rabbits and birds, and poisonous darts in other tribes made it easier to take out larger animals that might otherwise be unbothered by a thin wooden dart. Today, blowguns are classified as a weapon and are prohibited in many countries, except, as you might guess, the United States. Though they're obviously inferior to modern weapons, blowguns have left a strong legacy in the Americas and around the world. Competitive blowgun shooting is a popular sport in many countries and even has a growing movement to become a future Olympic sport. One suggestion to standardize the rules would be based on none other than Cherokee rules for blowgun competition, where shooters attempt to hit targets in sets of three that are further and further away as they progress through the rounds. So don't be surprised if we see some traveling Native American blowguns in the Olympics in the coming years.